Hi, thank you for joining Bible study. And we're going to be looking in Exodus, Exodus 19. Uh, this is the beginning of a, of a segment we're going to spend some time looking at where God rescued Israel from Egypt. We saw that. That's the Exodus itself, the departure. And they've been brought to Mount Sinai. And here God is going to make a covenant with them. And the word isn't necessarily in that, but it is a pattern throughout Genesis that God would make these promises. And that's what's at the crux of a covenant, is God was making promises to people, to nation now. He would be their God and they would be his people. And in the mindset of this time in the ancient Near East, it was important as a group of people to have a powerful God in covenant with you, to be your protector, to be your provider, to be your guide. And so there was a common language among the other nations that there needed to be someone uh, supernatural to look out for. And if you didn't have that, then, you know, you would ally yourself with a bigger nation or that king, or they would just come and beat you up and, and you would have to make a covenant with them, a promise, a vow to serve them, but they would provide that protection and they would look out for you and guide you. And they would kind of be the, the overlord in that scenario but it had benefits especially if you did what you were supposed to but there were also consequences if you didn't do what you were supposed to and so this is written throughout this and so this is kind of a normal arrangement because in that time and in that part of the world if you were out on your own you were a target you needed protection you needed help you needed someone to make sure that the rains would come to make sure that conditions would work so that you could meet your needs. And if that fell through, then there was a backup. You know, you needed that. And so that's woven throughout this. You won't necessarily hear the words covenant in it, but you're going to see that pattern. And so here's the start of it. We get to Exodus chapter 19, and it says, In the third month of the children, after the children of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on the same day, they came to the wilderness of Sinai, for they had departed from Rephidim, had come to the wilderness of Sinai, and camped in the wilderness. So Israel camped there before the mountain. And Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. So Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before them all these words which the Lord commanded him. Then all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken we will do. So Moses brought back the words of the people to the Lord. And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I come to you in the thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak with you and believe you forever. So Moses told the words of the people to the Lord. So here's our passage. We've made it to Mount Sinai. God had promised to Moses when he was at the burning bush that he would bring him back to Sinai to worship. And that was a part of the, the agreement. If you go to Egypt, then I'll bring you back to this special place as a nation and make my covenant with you there. And so Moses goes up the mountain and he gets these instructions. But the instructions have a preface to them, a preamble, so to speak. And he says, this is what I want you to remind the house of Jacob. This is what I want you to remind the children of Israel. 
You saw what I did to the Egyptians. You saw the liberation I accomplished for you. I rescued you from slavery. I've already saved you. And that's an important order to get in this. Is that God in his grace and faithful to his character already has done the rescue of this generation. They've already been saved. And now that he has saved them, he didn't just cut them loose and say, all right, well, good luck. Find someone else to look out for you. No. He saved them in order to be in relationship with them. Do you see the pattern for us? We get saved. But God doesn't just save us and say, all right, here's your little ticket. Go on. Get out of my hair, kid. That's not how he works. He wants to have a relationship with us. And so here is what it looks like to have relationship with the one true God. And I use that term because here in verse 5 we see all the earth is mine. The Lord says, yeah, there's lots of things called gods out there. But he is the one over all. He is on top. Everything belongs to him. Everything belongs to him, including you and me. And so he says, you saw what I did, and I bore you on eagle's wings. You know, powerful, uh, both predator, but also a rescuing animal uh, that takes care of its young. I brought you to myself. And we said this as we were moving from Egypt to Sinai, that God was introducing himself to them. They really didn't know this God that had just rescued them by ten plagues, including the death of the firstborn of Egypt and had rescued them through the blood of the Passover lamb. God was introducing himself through the trials they would face as they went through the Red Sea. There should have been no mistake of his power in that and how he provided water for them through the rock and how he would provide manna for them. And, and even in that his particularities in that he provided the manna for six days, but on the seventh day they were to rest. He wanted them to get into that rhythm, setting them up. And so he says, you saw how I have carried you this far. They wouldn't have made it to Sinai if they were on their own. They would have just went back to Egypt, back to being slaves, because they didn't know how to do life. They weren't ready to adult yet. And so he had brought them to himself. And now he says, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all the people, for all the earth is mine. So here's that preamble of the word. We saw the word covenant. If you will obey my voice. So why is he expecting obedience? Well, one, they're going to be in relationship to him. And he's the one that's in the know. They're not. We just talked about it. They're not ready to be adults yet. In fact, they never will be. Neither really are we in comparison to God. We need someone to be looking out for us, both as protection and as guidance and as providing. And that's what God is, is saying, is that if you'll do that, then you'll receive the blessing of having the Lord Almighty as your provider, protector, and guide. You'll be to me a special treasure above all other peoples. All the earth belongs to him. Egypt, Mesopotamia, and all the people from China to the Americas, beyond what even Israel knew existed. But he says, I'm going to use you as my special treasure. My my unique people above all those other people. Why would he be doing that? What has he got in his mind? Well, we know that he's going to be revealing himself through these people. They can be willing participants in this, or they can be examples in this of what not to do. But they get to have this special opportunity to be his chosen people. Remember that word? 
because of promises God made to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and theirs and his 12 sons, this is, this is their unique privilege. And he has started that by rescuing them from slavery. And so here they are. He says, you can be my special treasure to me above all others. And he says, you will be what? A kingdom of priests. A nation of people who have direct access to God. Now there will be a priesthood. Don't get me wrong. But in comparison to all other nations, it's like they are a kingdom of priests. With God as the king and all of them having access to God. And as you read through the scriptures, you realize that's right. Because God would interact with people based on them simply seeking after him. Not because they had the right pedigree, being descendants of Aaron or of the tribe of Levi. You shall be to me a kingdom of priests. Idea of priests, having direct access to God and representing God to others. Bring people to God and bring God to the people. And you'll be a holy nation. They'll be set apart for God's purposes and uses. And that they will be distinct from the sin and worldliness that surrounds them. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. And I want to unpack a few of these things here. Because you've already noticed. Salvation first. Then he makes these promises and relationship, saved to be in relationship, because he's talking the same thing to us as well, isn't he? We get to experience the full blessing of being saved by God, for God, when we walk with God. Because he's chosen us to know him, to reveal him. We have that kind of direct access to God. You know, it's really interesting. Uh, we're at the very front of your Bible. But if you were to flip to the very back of your Bible, there in Revelation chapter 1, verse 6, and it kind of depends on the translation uh, that you use based on the manuscripts that they used to translate from. But I want you to notice a couple passages here. Revelation 1, verse 6, He has made us kings and priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever. And some of your translations say, he made us a kingdom and priests. He has saved us so that we are now above the fray of all these little nations of the earth into the one true, the kingdom of God that will last forever and ever and ever. I love our country. We've been given special uh, privileges and, and blessings, but it isn't the kingdom of God. It is only as blessed as it resembles the kingdom of God and as there's more people in the kingdom of God. But as we depart farther and farther from God, then it becomes no greater of a nation than all the others, except that it has more money and maybe military. But that's not what makes a nation great. It's having God the Lord Jehovah as their God. And so I want to make sure I'm a part of that kingdom, the kingdom of God, and living for it. As you hear the elders sing to the Lamb in chapter 5, you are worthy to take the scroll to open its seals, for you were slain and you have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. Again, it says, you've made us a kingdom and priests. We've been brought into a kingdom where all of us have that kind of access to God. And it supersedes, every, did you catch that? Every tribe, every tongue, every people, every nation. And that's the picture we are given here, is God has redeemed us and made us into his kingdom. And that's not the only term he uses for his people. 
He calls us his church, his bride, his family, as well as his kingdom. And so this is an important symbol here. And so we've been called to be a, a holy nation. We represent. We've been rescued in order to be set apart. Set apart from sin and from other uses to be for God's uses. For his purposes. So no longer slaves to sin and the world, but to live unto God. There's another really cool passage here in 2 Corinthians. I'm flipping over there. You can with me. It's in chapter, chapter 5 where the Apostle Paul says, um, For the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again he saved us that we might live for him he has given us life from dead in order that we may live for him this is great stuff and i think you can see that so we've been set apart for him and as you see that in israel there's many laws that they were given they really don't make sense to us but they were to set them apart from their neighbors. And there was, you know, there was helpful things and don't eat pork because it probably wasn't going to get cooked right anyways and you get sick. But in reality, it was really setting them apart from all their neighbors. That God held them to a higher standard. So like the dietary things, don't eat catfish, don't eat uh, pork, was to protect them. And some of them though were just Plainly to set them apart is different. Don't eat clothes, or don't eat clothes. Don't wear clothes that are of a blended fiber. No cotton polyester blends for you. You would be wearing something that was all cotton, or all wool, or all linen. They were to be pure, not only on the inside, but they to be reflected on the outside. And their clothes was to have little tassels on the ends to remind them to keep God's law. That would set them out. They would look weird. It would be really weird because all their neighbors would be working on Saturday and they would be practicing a Sabbath. And everyone would say, what, are you lazy or are you just sick or what's wrong with you? And they'd be like, no, this is our time to be with God and show that we know he's the one who provides for us, not our own hands. He uses our hands to provide for us. But to show that we trust it's him that's actually doing it, we stop using our hands on that day. Meaning we stop our work. And they would, those things set them apart as being an odd people perhaps. But it was that people would notice them and then notice their God. And that's where rubber meets the road. That's what God has called us to be as well. God called us to be different. And that's where I want to take you back to 1 Peter. And this is where we'll finish up. 1 Peter. Peter obviously thought a lot about this passage. But as you read through it here, a couple different things stand out to me. He says, As obedient children, not conforming yourselves. This is chapter 1, verse 14. Not conforming yourselves to the former lust, as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. God is holy. So he's called us to also be holy. That doesn't mean just have holes in your genes. But it means to, to be turning from sin, repenting of it, in order to walk with God. Willing to look weird in the world. Because that's the funny thing. Is that, you know, lots of kids, they're like, oh, I want to be different. Where'd you get this pattern? Oh, I want to be just like them. They always want to be fitting in to something. Just like the rest of us. We want to fit in. We don't want to stand out. But God's standards for our sexuality will set us apart from this world. Especially from this culture. 
Will we be holy unto God or will we try to fit into the world? You know, the things that we do and the things that we intake, you know, drugs and alcohol, those things are, are rampant around us. But God has called us to be holy, to be pure. And so he is making us different. It's for our good, but it's also for his glory. But if we live different, walking with God, then we'll also have a hope and a love and a compassion that will set us apart. And that is to entice others to go with us. Because here I want you to see this in chapter 2 of 1 Peter. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Beloved, I beg you, as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. But right there in, in chapter 2, verse 9, he pulls out those same terms that we saw in Exodus 19. Did you see them? Royal priesthood, a kingdom of priests, right? A holy nation, a set-apart kingdom for God and his own special people from every kingdom, every tribe, every tongue, every nation. That you may reveal, proclaim the praise of the one true God, the Almighty. That we would be a peculiar people, zealous for good works, Paul told Titus in chapter 2, 14. That's God's desire for us. And so, yeah, in this world, we'll look like strangers. We'll look odd as we abstain from the flesh and the world, which is at war with our very souls, but to maintain an honorable conduct. And so that is an act of repentance even now. Oh God, the things that we've done wrong, we're sorry. Help me to do better today than I did yesterday. And asking Christ to work through us in that. Because we can't do it on our own. But he has empowered us through his Holy Spirit to do just that. It is an exciting opportunity that we are in to have been saved and made the special people of God. Let us walk in it. We've got more to come. Keep reading in Exodus. God bless.